Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about Jean Baudrillard's idea of seduction. Now, I've covered all of his texts on this channel and I've been scared to cover this term because it's a, it's a difficult one. So I'm going to do my best here to make it as accessible as possible. And uh, hi, I'm David, for those that are new. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, you can go check out how many ever videos, how many videos I already have up, something like 250 or, you know, by subscribing, you'll see videos I release every single week if you're into that. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video accompanying it on YouTube. Uh, if you want to help me out, do all those things I just mentioned. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. So yeah, let's jump into this very important term in Baudrillard's work. So this term really marks a shift in Baudrillard's thinking about systems. Now, before this point, before this term really became prominent in his work in the late 70s, he was using the term reversibility. Now, reversibility, to be quite simple in his work, transforms into seduction. Now, as a side note, at the beginning of his uh, kind of theoretical career, he didn't have a very good outlook of reversibility. He thought that reversibility wasn't very much of a radical alternative to the system at hand. So for example, he writes about media systems, he writes about various media like radio and television to say that any reversibility of these media, that is the um, transmission of progressive ideas on these media, won't do anything to actually get at the underlying logics that portend these media and that kind of underwrite these media that are oppressive. So at that time, and this is really from for a critique of the political economy of the sign, he thought that reversibility was just a kind of reformist uh, liberal strategy to oppose things. It didn't actually mark any revolutionary change or anything like that. Now this gives way to the idea of seduction in the late 70s with the text called Seduction, in which he really reevaluates his relationship to reversibility. Now you might be thinking, well, what really is the relationship between reversibility and seduction? Well, seduction, as the term implies, implies a bringing to oneself or a uh, kind of appealing to oneself to bring something else into part of you that is vulnerable or toward you that is vulnerable. Now, seduction speaks to this movement. That is, it speaks to the process of ideas of differing identities, of differing people, always existing in the proximity of another that is bringing them to that other. So two opposing ideas are always going to be, are always going to exist in a kind of somewhat steady equilibrium and are always going to be compelled to become the other thing. And it is by virtue of that knowledge of that possibility of becoming the other thing that they attain their identity as each side of this pole uh, or of this uh, spectrum. So for example, really easy way to understand this is the distinction between hot and cold that he talks about in his text called Seduction. And he says that neither of these things has an identity of their own. We only know what hot is in comparison to what cold is. But in that, and that would be a kind of deconstructive argument as Derrida gives it to us, in that though, there's something more going on. And this is where Baudrillard really is uh, unique and creative and original here. He suggests that hotness is always going to be hot, <laughs> is always going to be seduced by coldness. It is always going to be threatened to become that very thing that it opposes and vice versa. And this gives it its kind of identity. Now this is a very simple way to understand it. We're going to get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty, but the point that I want to really emphasize now is that it seduction refers to the movement of two different terms, identities, ideas, in coming closer to one another that is serves as a constitutive moment for them to be separate to establish their own identities, not as universal, uh, unchanging identities, but always in proximity to another thing, another idea that brings them or pulls them away, it away from itself. So in seduction, things are arrested, they're pulled away 
from the, their own idea about their uh, universality. And this opens up the door for possibility and change. Now, if any system tries to oppose this logic of seduction, tries to break away from the opposing thing, it'll actually mean that the opposing thing will take over. So, for example, he presents us with a little story in seduction called uh, Death at, in Samarkand. And this story, to be really quick about it, involves a man who sees death riding on horseback in, this, in the town of Samarkand, I believe. And so the man says, oh, death is here. Uh, he must be coming for me. I'm going to run over to the next village. Let's call it uh, Montreal. I'm going to run over to Montreal so that death can't find me. So uh, he goes and does that. And then meanwhile, death goes and has a conversation with the king of this original city, Samarkand, or might be reversed, whatever. The point remains the same. And the king says, oh, what, what are your plans? And the guy's like, well, my next visit is in uh, Montreal to go and kill this guy who's due to die. Now, the idea here, even though I could have gotten the names confused, whatever, the idea here is that in trying to avoid the very thing that the opposite of himself, death, that is the opposite of his being alive, it actually fulfills that destiny of death. So by strictly opposing one term, one idea to the other, actually creates a disequilibrium where one will take over. Now, this is a kind of bare bones understanding of the very operation of seduction, you know, trying to maintain some degree of equilibrium between two opposing terms or ideas. Otherwise, there's this disequilibrium, one will take over the other, and, and so, so, so on. In terms of death, though, to really belabor this point a bit, someone smart out there would say, well, death is inevitable. So it seems like seduction is always going to lead to this dis disequilibrium. And that's true. But that's only true if we look at it in terms of a certain scientific and social arrangement in which death means nothing. Death marks simply an end. Now, in his work, and this is Baudrillard's real intelligence in my mind, in his work, he really lends a lot of credence to the idea of symbolic exchange, which is a an old form of, of exchange, an old form of uh, kind of a, an economy, even though it's still, there's residues of it today, but let's borrow that for now. Under symbolic exchange, death doesn't mark an end. It is the extension of life in that death meant something. It could have meant something uh, to rejuvenate crops. It could have meant something to uh, motivate people on like a battlefield in like Greek times or whatever. Uh, death marks something new. So it didn't mark an end. So even in this arrangement, when death is accepted, death is something that is still kept in a steady equilibrium with life, as opposed to it just being uh, negated. And then it means nothing and it will just, it will just take over. But seduction operates at another level as well. And by virtue of it operating at the level of, uh, or how it opposes universality, how it opposes unchangingness. It exists at the level of appearances. That is, it, it is going to comply with certain movements, certain ideas that oppose rigid structures of determining identities, so to speak, or ideas. So it is going to be operated at a kind of superficial level. And it reveals the extent to which all of the attachments we have to various ideas, identities, culture, whatever, exist quite superficially, and they are then quite malleable. They are open to change. They can, they can form and reform, mutate into new and other things in proximity to other opposing ideas that are going to uh, motivate that change. Now, in order to remain true to the logic of seduction, that is the idea of opposing ideas kind of uh, gravitating toward one another, pulling toward each other, bouncing off each other and so on. What we have here is established an idea about appearances as being a constitutive factor of seduction, which we must oppose in order to be really continue with this logic. We must oppose this with its opposite, which would be universality, which would be, uh, you know, unchanging trueness, things that don't just lend themselves to appearances. So one way to think about this would be a distinction between um, maybe biology and appearance, or between essence and appearance. 
between uh, a true, uh, true unchanging characteristics and just the appearance that can change and alter. So in this arrangement, we now have a new split. We have a split between a new opposition, a new dialectic, if you will, between one idea that is biology, truth, uh, unchanging universals versus appearance, which is superficial, which is open to change. Now, as opposed to dialectical thinking that would imply there is to be a kind of reconciliation between the two ideas, Baudrillard wants to maintain a distinction between the two so that each of them can always engage in a kind of mutation and always engage in their own development. So what this means then is that the unchanging universal on one side is going to undergo various superficial mutations and really at the level of like biology or anything like that of course this is going to happen i mean our whole relationship to everything true or universal is going to come down to its relationship its presentation through science we only know biology through uh through textbooks that represent certain things in certain ways and this corresponds to a certain style so in order for anything to actually attain the status of universality it must pass through a stage of appearance of superficiality and really, and I'll talk about this more in a few moments, but Judith Butler's idea about performativity really resonates here, where in her, in her work, which she really does in, in her own brilliance, it suggests that it is not sex that dictates gender, but we can actually reverse that to say that it is gender that dictates sex. And she gives all these examples about how these scientists were looking at chromosomes, they were looking at uh, I, other biological factors, and bestowing upon them certain gendered characteristics that would come to then stand in for superficial gender identities. So it's a kind of reversal of what we saw occur there. So by sort of submitting biology in this case to this appearance, status of appearance, what we see then, or what this opens the door to, is that kind of affirmation of seduction as everything being to some extent appearance and existing at that level. But we need to maintain some degree of this uh, rigidity, this universality, this kind of truth in order to always problematize that truth because we need some kind of base upon which to engage any kind of discourse at all. But have that truth always be disturbed and unsettled at the same time, always problematizing that realm of appearance and superficiality opening it up to mutation and change and development. Now let's consider this more in terms of the distinction between the masculine and the feminine, which is something that Baudrillard pays a lot of attention to as well, and the distinction between uh, really just masculine and feminine. And he makes it clear that he's not referring here to like real biological distinctions, even though at times he most certainly is, but he's very clear that he's not doing that. Now, what he wants to try to do here is thinking, think about the ways that men and women, the masculine and the feminine, are constructed regulatively in this world. What I mean by regulatively is how they are perceived in this world. So what men, the masculine, is meant to represent versus the feminine. So some basic attributes that are often associated with each might be like men, the masculine, is associated with uh, science, rationality, truth, whereas the feminine is associated with superficiality, uh, deception uh, appearances and the idea that you know women wear makeup as a way to realize this destiny of of superficiality you know really in in a lot of ways really reprehensible ideas but the idea here that he's trying to problematize is that this distinction reveals the extent to which the privileged ideas associated with masculinity are always going to un undergo their own mutations, their own developments. And this is partly due to the fact that Baudrillard says that it's it's just boring to exist in that realm of just like pure truth, pure science, pure um, rationality, because it really inhibits possible change and development. So if one of these terms were to completely, uh, were to take full control, in this case, this kind of uh, biology as destiny in terms of um, you know, people being purely determined by their gender and, and that's really it, their, or their sex, I should say, and that's really it. If, you know, we're still, we're working here within a gender binary, of course, reductively, but in any case, if we're looking at it in those terms to submit people to their 
biology is to limit that possibility. It is, in a sense, to limit that possibility of seduction that serves as the backdrop for all possible change and mutation. So what we would see then is just a submission to a kind of code that determines and regulates how people can really exist and act. And it by and by sequestering or by um, denying the realm of appearances to say that it is just uh, frivolous non-meaning, it doesn't have any real um, ground to it, by resisting that or by reducing that side of things, we have effectively just reduced all possibility in favor of a kind of biological determinism or uh, in favor of essence versus, dare I say, existence. And what that then means is limiting possibility, limiting mutation, and limiting the logic of seduction to uh, allow things to change. Now, what's really the point of all this? Why is he talking about this? Well, for the most part, his criticism here, or his idea here was motivated by second wave feminists who were trying to, in a, in a lot of cases, and these are mostly white women, in fact, just about all of the ones he presents are white women, who were trying to find a kind of innate feminine essence, to say that all women have this kind of innate feminine essence, like men are from Mars and women are from Venus type thing. And of course, the same applies to men. Men have this kind of essence. Baudrillard was responding that to that to say that by submitting to that logic means a submission to, to a patriarchal conception of identity to reduce it to biology, to reduce it to a kind of truth that is going to limit appearance, it's going to limit the possibility of uh, change and the possibility of possibility itself, which isn't going to motivate any kind of progressive change, it's just going to be more of the same. And I think that it is, it is a good heuristic tool, and what I mean by that, it is a good teachable moment here that Baudrillard gives us, and that is to embrace as much as possible a degree of humility when confronted with the ideas of others, to be able to sit with them and say that while I might disagree, these people might be open to different experiences, different uh, ideas that I just have no idea about and I can't confirm nor deny. And it is about recognizing a distance between ideas, opposing ones, and to therefore recognize that not all chasms, not all breaches, not all spaces are meant to be bridged and understood. To do otherwise is to try to submit all people, all, all ideas, to a kind of spectral scientific logic to be able to subsume all ideas under a over single overarching narrative that is going to give them a kind of singular identity. And this is going to fly in the face of seduction that tries to maintain distinctions, tries to maintain oppositions, maintain singularity, that is, these differences, what he calls later in his career, uh, the absolute differences that allow things to stick to their own being as they are in relationship to an opposing idea that always problematizes them, always motivates them to change and develop. Because seduction for Baudrillard, and this comes out of, I believe this, this quote comes out of the book Fatal Strategies, he suggests that in relation to provocation, seduction is not the act of trying to bring someone into your domain of strength to be able to say, I'm going to defeat this opposing term by bringing it into a terrain that is alien to it, because that's unfair. If you were to challenge someone to a board game that they have no idea how to play, you will probably win. What seduction does is it brings something over to yourself in order for you to engage with it on your level of weakness, in order to motivate growth, it is about bringing the opposing idea to you so that you may lose. And there's a lot that can grow out of this act of losing, out of, the, out of this act of being wrong. It is only in that process that growth is really possible. And seduction really permits that. It allows that. And by trying to oppose something with your strength or trying to sequester the opposing term will just result in that same ending to the story that I presented at the beginning with death in Samarkand, where the guy fled to Samarkand, I said Montreal, whatever, fled to Samarkand in order to avoid the opposing idea, but that only meant that that idea was going to be affirmed in his ultimate death. 
And that's pretty well it. Uh, it's a tricky term, and there's more to it than this. I won't try to dupe you and say that I've covered every element of this term. You really have to go and read all of his texts to grasp this, as far as I understand it. Uh, but yeah, if there's anything that you think I should have included here, I would love to hear about it. Anything I got wrong, I would love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform that lets you leave five stars, I'd love for you to do that. You can leave a review. I love to read them all. I don't have the time to respond to all of them. Uh, but yeah, in any case, oh, if you're listening to this, I'm probably going to do a live stream at some time on Friday. I did a poll on YouTube for that. You can go and check that out if you want. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. Take care.